Thanks very much for having me here. Um, this is joint work with colleagues Bartlett, Stanton, and Wallace at Berkeley. Bartlett is a, a lawyer. Um, and so this, what I'm going to present is going to be kind of a combination of this paper, which is finance, as well as a legal paper that we are currently writing. Um, the other thing is, I want to say, if you're not in finance, don't zone out. You can replace all the finance words I have in here with hiring and labor. Right, so the law and the mapping of statistical discrimination to use of algorithmic data um, and var variables um, is what this paper is about. Okay, so we started this with the goal of understanding, you know, what, how much discrimination is happening, but more importantly, what the effect of algorithms are on unbiasing the face-to-face -face, uh, lending proposition, but it could be in other contexts. So in the context we're going to look at here is mortgages, just because we have the data on it. And um, platforms have taken over the mortgage market, whether it's Quicken, the rocket mortgage in the US, or all the lar large banks are now algorithmic. You can apply completely for a mortgage online. Um, so uh, you know, ex ante, we weren't sure what we were going to find. It's unclear whether you get rid of the white male that we had in the last, the last conversation, the loan officer whether those in-group biases or, or discrimination cause more or less <coughs> discrimination because of the role of, of statistical discrimination in the use of the thousand variables that we just heard about. Um, materiality, any, any basis point uh, increase in the price of mortgages is, is, going to, oops, is going to end up with a 160 million extra in interest per year in the U.S. market. So, any price discrimination is material here. Okay, so what do we do? I'm gonna talk about what the legal basis is, and it took us a long time to understand the legal basis, and now I have a very simple way I'm gonna explain it. Um, and then we're going to estimate the level of, of discrimination in the mortgage market because of the role of Freddie and Fannie, the GSEs in the, in the US market, eliminating credit risk. Okay, so I'll, I'll get to that. So first, a bit of a plug. Um, it's a big issue. This was is nice when you get a letter. It doesn't matter which senator. This happens to be Elizabeth Warren, who wrote a letter about our paper to the head of the Fed, the OCC, the FDIC, and the CFPB, saying, "Have you seen this paper? What are you doing?" The letter goes on. So it's a little bit nice when you this, these kind of issues get this much attention. Okay. So let me go right in. The legal standard. So the issue in the, is not the law, right? The law says that you can't discriminate in the process of, of issuing mortgages or any loans and such, right? But how do you implement, implement the law in the courts? This is the issue. And the court precedent um, is based in the concept in, in, in US terms, but it's the same in the UK, and I believe it's the same with different terminology slightly here in Canada, um, of legitimate business necessity. So legitimate business necessity in, in hiring, it, the, the terms that have been used is fundamental skills necessary, right? So someone has to have a fundamental skill necessary, and then you can use statistical discrimination as a signal extraction method, right? Okay, so l let me give an example of how, how, this, how to think about what the courts have said on the use and misuse of legitimate business necessity, because that's what we care about. Okay, here's an example in labor from firefighters and prison guards. So the fundamentals, a fundamental skill necessary, the court has deemed, is strength, okay? Um, a, in Los Angeles, a female applied to, to be a prison guard. This is a case. And the Los Angeles County, I believe it was, was using height as a proxy variable for strength, right? And this woman sued. She didn't get the job because she got scored on an average of women and the, you know, the, height, the height scoring. And she sued, and the court ruled in her favor, saying, importantly, although strength is indeed a fundamental skill necessary, and importantly for proxy variables, although height is correlated with strength, strongly correlated with strength, it still was that, and it took us a year and a half to write this next sentence, the residual is still correlated with gender, right? That was a year and a half for me to write that one sentence, right? That if you regress height on strength for some population where you bring them in and measure, right? 
if that residual is still correlated, and I talked to Lars Hansen about what the correlated mean, right? The court has to decide what the level of correlation you have to adjust for the number of variables, blah, 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 observations, sorry, not variables, then, then this is not legitimate business necessity. Okay, so in terms of lending, legitimate business necessity, court has ruled that it's, it's creditworthiness, okay? And explicitly, not profits above creditworthiness. So you cannot make, have a higher profit margin from a, a protected category, where the protected categories are gender and, and race and ethnicity and so forth, right? If a white male has, you get a higher profit margin, that's okay, right? It's not saying we can't do pricing strategies, but the pricing strategies cannot cause a higher profit margin from one cat for the protected categories, okay? So this then leads us to the method, which I've already said, you know, how would you think about using proxy variables? I don't have a lot of time here, so I'm not gonna cover this slide, but the idea is, let's say, for example, that I can't see wealth in the lending context, so I use my thousand variables, and one of my variables might be is the, the high school name, not whether you have a high school education, but the high school name, right? That's correlated with wealth. The question is, is that residual, once you orthogonalize it to the fundamental credit score, you know, eco one, econ 101 life cycle variables, repayment variables, right? Once you take those out, is that residual still correlated with the protected category of ethnicity, okay? Then, so then we get into the structural I.O. conversation that Susan athey has been talking about, about preferences and behaviors. But conspicuous consumption, which is gonna be correlated with default, doesn't work because then you're gonna profile on a scoring variable that applying to everyone, and there's someone in that, that, that group that's, been, that's being um, unfairly priced or unfairly scored with that variable. Anyway, so that, that is the legal foundations as we have interpreted and, and, and presented this a number of times to different regulators. Okay, so that is half of what I wanna do here. The other half of what I wanna do here is estimate price discrimination in the lending market. Okay, so, so um, the reason I wanna do this is we have a setting where we can remove credit risk and just focus on this pricing and seeing how, see how much discrimination is happening with traditional face-to-face -face lending and then with algorithmic lending. See if algorithms are unwinding biases or they're retaining some or even more um, discrimination from the use of proxy variables. Okay, so um, in the interest of time, the data took us two years to put all these data sets together. We have millions and millions of observations of all the, the mortgages that go through Freddie and Fannie in the U.S., which is the largest market. So um, it's something on the order. We start out with 20 million observations. Okay, um, the GSC process, quickly, you go in for a loan, the, the lender uh, takes the material, passes the material off to Freddie or Franny, the GSEs. They, they give a answer, yes or no. The lender gives an answer, yes or no, and then the lender makes a pricing decision. I'm gonna focus today on the pricing decision. We have some stuff in the paper about the yes or no decision, but I'm, I'm interested in the price. So um, if the lender accepts, if the applicant accepts, the lender then sells the mortgage to the GSE and has no credit risk, during the crisis, there was a lot of putback risk. That's over now. There's papers that show that that's over. Okay, so there's no credit risk residual. So the lender's pricing strategy is based on competitive, competitive factors of what price they think they can offer to a client to a client that they will take up the mortgage. And in particular, the price consists of three pieces. One is the market rate. This is like the risk-free rate for mortgages. The G fee is the guarantee rate. The guarantee rate in mortgages is completely determined by two things, the, the LTV, the loan to value ratio, and the credit score. In this bucket, this is the bucket of the GSEs, right? These buckets completely determine the credit price. Thus, when I go back to this picture, this is the full credit worthiness adjustment. Anything else is discretionary. You cannot have any disparate impact in anything beyond credit worthiness. Therefore, when I go to the Sorry. When I go to the, the model, I can do a simple regression, interest rate on a minority variable. I'm going to focus on 
uh, Latinx and African Americans, and then absorb the grid, the thing I just showed you, absorb time, I can interact those two, it doesn't matter, I have millions of observations, right? And this is a full credit risk model, any loading alpha is discrimination, okay? So that is the main breakthrough in, in, econometrically in this paper, that I can completely isolate discrimination. Economists are gonna say, well, we'd really like to see lender and, and some geography fixed effects, I can put those in too, okay? All right, so let me show you how that works in, in the graph. So here's the interest rates for everyone else and, and the minority variable I'm gonna focus on. When I take out the grid and time, then I, it, it compresses, I should scale these the same, but you can see it compresses tightly. The question is whether these, these black bars are still further this way than the other, right? I can show you that in an estimation, okay? Here it is, the, the raw difference in rates that Latinx and African Americans are paying is nine basis points. Once you take out the grid, notice I'm absorbing 73% of the of the variation, when you take out the grid, you still have 7.8 basis points of discrimination. Is 7.8, is, is a lot of zeros, is that any money? The average profit rate on a mortgage is 70 basis, 50 basis points, so eight out of 50 is pretty big. If you add it up, so that's the purchase mortgage refi is smaller. If you add it up together, the, the, the minorities are paying in the U.S. 765 million extra per year in interest because of this discrimination. Okay, that's the main result, except that I haven't said anything about FinTech. How much time do I have? Okay, so here are the, the same. Now I'm focusing on a very isolated subsets of platforms that were originally platforms. Now, today, all the lenders have some, most of the lenders have some platform elements, but these are ones that are strictly platform. Um, and what do we find? So before, on the prior slide, that 5.3 basis points was 7.8. And that, that 1.9 was 3.5. So are fintechs better? Yes, they are better. Indeed, we're getting rid of some face-to-face -face discrimination, and I don't want to diminish that. That's a good thing. Are they getting rid of discrimination as a whole? No. And is this the, just the tip of the iceberg? Yes. Why is it the tip of the iceberg? Because in this setting, it's the least advantage because of the credit worthiness, uh, the, the, sorry, the credit risk absorbing by Freddie and Fannie, the least advantage for using all those variables. All those variables in this setting, what is this discrimination? This is, this is pricing discrimination based on shopping behavior, behavior financial de deserts, competitive. Can we use algorithms to infer what areas where you, if you give a quote, that someone will take up that loan? Of course we can, right? Lenders were doing this already just from, from their intuition of where there's a competitive environment, where there's a financial desert, where, where people are uncomfortable with financial institutions and thus are not gonna shop around. I partially grew up in Mississippi. Some of the banks in Mississippi look like plantations, right? Think about that, right? Does that make you comfortable with financial services? No. Are you gonna shop around? No, right? And so all of these things and our algorithms can pick them up. So is it good that we have the, the, the algorithmic um, getting rid of the face-to-face -face bias? Totally. But is it solving our problem of, of bias? No, it is not, right? And so, and I'm, I'm dwelling on this because this is the most important slide. You could do this in hiring as well. It's also true in bail. In, in bail bond issuances that they're using algorithms for as well. But the, the, the idea here that, that we're able to program more and more and more understanding of individual preferences on these loans and then price accordingly, right, is something serious that, that we have to think about the consequences in terms of the law, right? It's not saying that, that pricing behaviors are bad. People are allowed to have pricing behaviors uh, firms are allowed to do pricing in all kind of contexts, but under the law, you cannot cause disparate impact. Okay, so that is the main gist, and that's why I focused on, on this particular slide is the main gist. Um, this is, we include the lender and county fixed effects, right? And then we do a, um, 
go after robustness. I don't know how much my discussion is going to go after me, but um, we do robustness to concerns about points. Um, we downloaded some data that Humda just came out with in 2018 that actually had points. Um, we, we do things on servicing cost and on coding errors um, as well in terms of the, the uh, um, ethnicity. Okay, so those are, that's the main the main piece. But I want to talk about fintech in one more piece, um, and I think this is a general a general statement is that um, there's issues of there's there's the possibility that the introduction of here I'll just show you the picture the introduction of being able to apply for a mortgage or being able to apply for a loan online has created a more competitive space. And in fact, our data are very, are very consistent with that. Right? So this is discrimination plotted over time. And in refinance mortgage, mortgages, people are more sophisticated, less hurried. So we see a lot more discrimination happening in purchase mortgages than in refi in general. And that makes sense. They're, they're also, they, it just makes sense that people are a little more discerning in refis. Uh, this is discrimination basis points. I've just taken a couple of zeros out, yeah? And so we, we find that over time, now can I peg this as being causal? No, what, what I showed you before, I believe are causal estimates. But here, I can't say that this is because the competitive environment is changing, but it might be, right? And so, so further work needs to go into whether the, comp the landscape of being able to shop for a mortgage easier um, has led to a lower discrimination and people doing more shopping, right? If you do more shopping, you're going to end up with lower discrimination. The second silver lining um, is that we do, do an analysis on rejection rates as well, the yes-no decision. Um, saying no, if from a lender point of view, for someone that qualifies, is money left on the table. So any discrimination in this setting is, is, is dumb. Right? It, 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 it's not profit maximizing. What we find is that um, minorities face 7 to 9% more frequent rejections than the others, um, but not for the, for the fintechs. The fintechs are good at unwinding discrimination in the yes, no, because it's profit maximizing to do so. Right? Which makes total sense, right? You've programmed the thing to profit maximize. They do, uh, they profit maximize over scoring people where they can get them to take a higher rate, and they profit maximize on accepting and rejecting, rationally so, without having those, those biases that, that traditional face-to-face -face loan officers do have. So those, all, those things fit together and, and they make sense. Okay, so let, let, me, let me try to wrap up and, and, and say one thing about what we're trying to do next. So the back of the envelope is 765 million um, in extra interest paid per year on the existing stock of mortgages. Um, based on, on these estimates. Um, the, um, the, 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 the nice piece of the takeaway is getting rid of the facial bias, the racial bias, face-to-face -face racial bias, is, is, is true. The algorithms are doing better. But are they unwinding it? No. The, on average, the, the, the algorithms are still doing 60%, and that's just the tip of the iceberg because of this, this setting. Um, I want to say one thing about the big and small lender thing. The, we've talked to a number of big lenders um, who actually are very much afraid in the, in the, in the U.S. And afraid of the, the law and what they can and they can't do. And we, whereas we've talked to a, a number of small players who are using all kinds of variables. Um, and they, you know, there's one we looked at the credit scoring model and they have the word black in there as a variable, which is obviously illegal. And the big lenders have asked for more instruction from regulators on what they can do. So when we talked yesterday about how the big ones feel more constrained, that's not necessarily true in this context, right? The big ones want instruction to be cut loose so they can use their big machines and their, their 3,000 variables to do what they, they want to do. Um, we offer a way, a, a way to do that scoring based on that basic residual model that the, the lenders just run their variables and do that test that we propose. And then the, the variable would be passed. They could, they could do it themselves like the banks are already doing their own modeling. 
and show it to the regulators. We, we think that that's a powerful proposition to say which of your, your uh, thousand variables are legitimate business necessity. And finally, we're working now on taking this data set, combining it with variables that we can understand monopoly rents, competitive environment, um, geography, financial deserts, and other things like this to understand where the competitive environment overlays in, into discrimination. So thank you very much. Thank you.